So this lecture will be is part of an online course on Galois theory and will be about the fundamental theorem of algebra. So this says that the complex numbers is an algebraically closed field. In other words, every polynomial that's non-constant has a root. Um, calling it the fundamental theorem of algebra is not actually a terribly good name because, first of all, it's not really a theorem about algebra because you can't prove it or even construct the complex numbers purely algebraically. I mean, you, it's, you have to sort of take the completion of the rationals to construct reals and so on. And um, the other problem is it's not really particularly fundamental these days in algebra. I mean, you can do an entire course in algebra without even mentioning it if you want to. Um, so um, it was um, probably conjectured or in about the 17th century, although it was rather difficult for people to state it then because the complex numbers hadn't really been properly defined or understood. Um, you know, people used to talk about fictitious roots of polynomials, meaning negative roots, because they were sort of rather dubious about even about the negative real numbers, never mind complex numbers. Um, anyway, the first proofs of it seem to be due to either Gauss or Argand both around 1800. Um, Gauss's proof was before Argand's proof, but it's not entirely clear that Gauss's proof was completely um, watertight. There may have been a small topological gap in it. Um, but anyway, um, so we've already given two proofs, or mentioned two proofs. First of all, we have a topological proof involving the winding number. So you remember we looked at a complex number z and made it go once around the origin and then we looked at p of z for a polynomial and saw that p of z winds n times around the origin and were able to deduce from that that p has a root. Um, a second proof um, comes from complex analysis. Um, so so um, um, which may be the almost the simplest proof, it says that if the polynomial P has no root, then 1 over P is bounded and holomorphic. So since it's got no roots, it's, it's, it doesn't have any poles, and it's easy to check it's bounded by looking at what happens for large values of Z. So by Liouville's theorem, it is constant. So there we've got a proof that would be one line long if I wrote slightly, slightly smaller letters. So if we've got two perfectly good proofs, why do we need another proof? Well, um, it's a bit embarrassing to have the something called the fundamental theorem of algebra um, only proved by um, using analysis or even worse topology. So if something's called the fundamental theorem of algebra, you really want it to have an algebraic proof just for the pride of your subject. Um, well, you can't really, because as I mentioned, you can't even, I mean, the, the, the real numbers and the complex numbers just aren't really algebraic objects. But what you can do is you can try and reduce the amount of analysis you need to a minimum. So Let's see what we need. So, so our assumptions are going to be as follows. So um, the zero assumption is that we have a, a finite field extension. R contains C of fields of characteristic zero. And I'm assuming characteristic zero because I got a headache trying to work out whether or not this is, whether what, what I say is true for positive characteristics. So I'm just going to assume characteristic zero because this makes it easier and is the only case I need. The first assumption is that any polynomial with real coefficients of odd degree has a root. 
in, in the reals. And this is kind of obvious from the intermediate value theorem of um, introductory calculus or whatever, because um, if, say, the leading coefficient is positive, then the polynomial will be negative for, our, for, for, for x negative and large, and it will be positive for x positive and large, and somewhere in going from a negative number to a positive number, it must cross the axis, and because the real numbers are complete, it must have a zero. Um, notice that this part of the, that, that, that saying a, a polynomial of odd degree must have a root is, it's not really algebraic. You need to sort of use the completeness of the real numbers in order to prove the existence of a root. For instance, if you do this for the rational numbers, it's simply not true. A polynomial of odd degree over the rationals doesn't necessarily have a rational root. Um, the second thing we're going to assume is that um, C has no extensions of degree 2. So this um, is equivalent to saying that every element of C has a square root because we assumed um, we're working characteristic 0. If, if we're working characteristic 2, you have to be a little bit more careful about this equivalence, but we won't worry about that. So what we're going to do is just use these two assumptions and from now on the proof will be purely algebraic. So, so the, the analysis we use is just the intermediate value theorem, which is really a very mild piece of analysis. So what we do is we look at R, contain C, and contain X. And we're going to take X to be any finite normal extension of R containing C. Now to show C is algebraically closed, it's enough to show that X is equal to C, because um, if C wasn't algebraically closed, we'd, we'd be able to find a non-trivial um, normal extension. Um, well, X is finite and normal, and it's also separable because we're in characteristic characteristic zero, so x over r is separable plus normal, so it's Galois. And let's put g to be the Galois group. So it's going to be some finite group. And now the idea is to translate our two conditions into conditions about the Galois group g. So, so we know subgroups of g correspond to extensions um, R contained L contained X between R and X. So our first assumption said that the any polynomial of odd degree has a root. In other words, there are no extensions of R of odd degree apart from the trivial one. So um, um, this says that um, um, any subgroup of x of odd index is just x, because, this, because an extension of odd degree of r corresponds to a subgroup of odd index. You remember the degree of the extension over r is actually the index of the corresponding subgroup, not, not, the, not the order of the subgroup. Um, now, um, we want the, uh, the the other condition was that any that, that C has no extensions of degree two. So so suppose H is the subgroup corresponding to C. Um, so you remember by the Galois correspondence, this just means H is the Galois group of um, X over C. So the automorphisms of X fixing all elements of C. Now, um, extensions of C now correspond to subgroups of H. So, so H has no subgroups of index 2, because we said that C has no extensions of degree 2. 
Um, when I say odd index and x, that should be g, I guess. I guess that should be g as well. Um, so we've got two properties of a group. G has no subgroups of odd index, and H in G has no subgroups of index 2. And uh, what we want to do is to show that um, that H is um, is 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 trivial. Um, well, this is easy. What we're going to do is just kill off this. Um, prove this theorem by just quoting results from group theory. So what we've done so far is we've taken a result about fields that C is algebraically closed and translated it into this purely group theoretical problem using Galois theory. Now we're going to use group theory to solve this. So we, we, what we do is we pick a C of 2 subgroup of G. And now we notice this has odd index because seal of two subgroups always have on odd index. So by one, it is the whole of G, because G has no subgroups of odd index other than G itself. So G has order two to the n for some n, because any seal of two subgroup has order two to the n. So H has order um, two to the m for some n. So H is nil potent. Um, so any group of prime power order is nil potent. So if H has order greater than one, it has a subgroup of index two. Because by the theory of nil potent groups, any group of order two to the M for M greater than zero has a subgroup of index 2. And H can't have a subgroup of index 2, so the order of H is equal to 1, so there are no um, extensions of the complex numbers. Okay, that's enough about the complex numbers being algebraically closed.